I'm Andrew Cross. Um, I'll talk today through the components in our, um, in our software stack and uh, talk to the IBM Quantum Experience and the language that we use to communicate with it. Um, and I mean, before I begin, what I'd like to do is, is give some uh, bounds on the problem that we're interested in solving, you know, the scope of the software that we're trying to write. And uh, you know, so where we are today, we're, we're sort of in this realm of simple demonstrations on, on small numbers of qubits. And we're moving in this direction toward larger systems. And these are systems that, on which we can run small circuits. We can do approximate computations. Uh, but we're very far from uh, you know, a universal fault tolerant quantum computer. So our, our goal is to write software that targets this kind of space. Um, and the purpose is to enable research so that we can continue to move forward and to uh, look for advantage where, uh, where there's advantage to be found. So solve problems with these small quantum processors. OK. So in a little more detail, our, our goal for this software stack, like we're going to plan for continued improvement of these devices. You know, right now we have five and 16 qubit devices. You've heard uh, other announcements. And uh, so we're planning for these to increase in size and capability and fidelity. And we want to build software tools so that we can continue working with these devices in the near term. So uh, we'd like to look at things such as short depth circuits, um, investigating algorithms, looking for advantage. And we're going to be in this era of pre-fault tolerance. So we'd like to explore ways to mitigate the errors that we see in these systems. Uh, so we need a framework so that we can uh, conduct experiments, we can run simulations, and we can analyze the data that we get back. We'd like this interface to be independent of the backends because, again, we're going to see new backends in the future. Um, we're going to see new simulation methods. We're going to see new ways of analyzing the results. So we'd like to be able to grow uh, into that. We'd also like to create an infrastructure for rewriting the, uh, the algorithms that we send, the circuits. And at the very least, you know, if this is meant to be backend independent, we need to take the algorithms and uh, schedule them and map them onto the hardware that we have. So we need an infrastructure for that, and we plan to include that. And then over time, from where we are now to where we plan to go in the, in, in the coming years, we'd like to expose lower level control interfaces so that uh, you have more control over pulse timing. Um, you have more control over the process of mapping onto the device, more control over the pulse shapes. And we'd like to also move in the other direction as well, so expanding in both directions, introduce some higher level abstractions so it's easier to program. All right. So as a touchstone for this whole talk, I'm just going to keep coming back to this uh, block diagram. So what this is, this is, um, you know, this is not exactly what's going on, but it's a high level organization of the pieces of the software as we would imagine them. And it's modeled after uh, how you would think of a, a quantum compiler. Okay, but we're really going to focus on the right hand side, the, the lower half of this process. Right, so um, you know, on the left, you have the quantum algorithm. You have some high-level description of it. You have the results you'd like to get. And uh, at some point, you generate quantum circuits. And these are stitched together by some kind of classical control. You know, at the moment, we're, we have uh, a, a limited uh, set of classical control. I'll talk about that later. Right? But these quantum circuits are then transformed in some way. And they are sent through an API. Um, on the back end, on our systems, these are um, you know, converted to pulse sequences. They run in the experiment. Um, there are a set of controllers and whatnot. And these processed results come back through this API. And you can request those results and then analyze them and then continue on. So of these, of these components, right, the, the quantum experience is everything behind this API. Um, so the, the hardware, the, right now, the, you know, the, the software that takes the circuits and maps them to pulse sequences. And uh, then there's the, the API. There's our open interface language. This is something that will be familiar to people who have been uh, in quantum computing. Uh, you know, it's uh, a list of gate operations that you can apply to our uh, system. And then this, um, this QuizKit uh, software is built around the, the circuit abstraction so that you can uh, write circuits and transform them and send them to the back end and process the results. All right, so I'll, I'll keep coming back to this picture as we move through these pieces. And I'll start from the right and move uh, to the left. Okay, so I'll start with the quantum experience. And uh, 
So just, just to say, so the quantum experience went online about a year and a half ago. And in that time, uh, we now have uh, more than 60,000 users registered. They've logged in from all seven continents, from many universities and colleges and uh, learning institutions. Um, people have run almost two million experiments on the devices that are there and have posted many papers to the archive as well, investigating the system and what it can do. So for example, in, just to explain what's in this picture, right, these uh, highlighted regions are regions where people have logged in and used. These are countries where people have logged in and used the quantum experience. And the, the dots, I think, are uh, uh, learning institutions, educational institutions. So as part of the quantum experience, we've been trying to create, uh, trying to engage with a broader community of you know, educators, developers, students, um, researchers who are interested in using these devices and, uh, and learning from them. So we've, um, you know, we've been uh, traveling and uh, um, engaging with students. This is an example at uh, USQIP at the uh, Institute for Quantum Computing. Uh, Chris Wood is um, working with students to um, run examples on the quantum experience. This is a, a community that, uh, like a, a forum that's available on the quantum experience website where um, people from the public who've requested accounts and uh, researchers, I mean, everyone can ask questions and uh, answer each other's questions. And we also do our best to, um, to, to moderate and answer questions that come up as well. And here's an example from, I believe from, from last year, uh, on the MIT edX uh, quantum computing course run by uh, Ike Chuang, where uh, one of the extra credit exercises was to go and look at uh, mapping circuits onto the quantum experience, the five qubit device. All right, so um, I'd like to say a little bit about what the hardware is that uh, you're controlling. I'm only going to talk about, I'm just gonna highlight a few things. If you want more detail, um, definitely come to Micah Takeda's talk this afternoon and, uh, you know, or at one of the breaks, uh, corner an experimentalist and ask them questions. Uh, so what you see here is, this is, um, this is a, a four qubit device. And in these uh, pockets are these single junction transmon qubits. And uh, just to give you an idea, right, the qubit transition is five gigahertz. The second excited state is slightly, you know, is offset by this anharmonicity, um, just to give you an idea of the kinds of parameters that are in these systems. And these, these um, devices are coupled by um, coplanar waveguides. So that, those are these blue and uh, other colored features here. The, the, um, the blue uh, resonators act as buses that couple neighboring qubits, and the yellow act as uh, input and output, you know, readouts and uh, uh, drive lines. All right, so the devices that are used in the quantum experience, uh, again, these are single junction transmon devices. T1 and T2 are about comparable. They're about 50 microseconds. In fact, you can see all of this if you go to the quantum experience and look online at the interfaces. But these are the single qubit and two qubit gate fidelities, around, you know, error around a percent to 5%. Um, these are the measurement fidelities. And all the devices are some kind of planar, uh, planar geometry. So the five qubit device looks like this, uh, this bow tie and these are the interactions that are available. And here's a picture of it. And uh, this is the 16 qubit device, so it's, uh, it's a dual rail, uh, two, two, two lines uh, connected by edges. This is a picture of the device as well. So these are the five and 16. The five qubit device is available on the graphical interface, and the 16 you can access through this software stack, through the API. All right, so, um, so good, all right. So I just say a few more words about what the gates are in the system so that when we see them later, uh, you, you know what, we're, what, what, I'm, what I'm referring to. All right, right, so we need single qubit, we we'd like to have arbitrary single qubit gates and then some entangling gates so we can implement universal digital computation. Um, and uh, I mean, here's how these are implemented. So it, generally we want to apply some, uh, something in SU2, some, some single qubit gate that's arbitrary we decompose this into Euler angles, so zy, z rotations, right? And it happens that um, these, these z rotations are um, easy to apply by adjusting the phase of a carrier. So they are uh, very accurate and fast. So it, it helps us to decompose the pulse sequence into uh, something of the form where we have this z rotation, and then we have some 
single calibrated gate that we apply um, in between these phase changes. So that's how these are, these are implemented. If you just want a Z rotation, then you can apply this gate. That's instantaneous. And uh, uh, there's no pulses, right? Uh, if you want to apply something that's a, a power two rotation, then um, you can apply this gate. That's one pulse. And then if you want to do something in general with two pulses, you can apply that. Right. The two qubit gate is a, um, what's called a cross resonance gate. And uh, I mean, for this talk, what's important about it is that um, it's, it's directional. So there's a, there's a control qubit and a target qubit. And there's, there's one direction where this gate is faster than the other. So that's why we, we do that this way. Um, and in practice, if you're interested, I mean, the, this is implemented by a sequence of pulses that correct for some, uh, some slow fluctuations. All right, so this, this stands for this frame change, this Z rotation. This stands for a drag pulse. And this stands for a, a flat top Gaussian pulse, something that's stretched out. Um, all right, so that gives you an idea of the one and two qubit gates in the system. All right, so if you go to the Quantum Experience website, and you don't even have to log in, actually, but if you look at the top, each of the backends, the, the devices, are, are listed there. Um, this is the, the latest backend in the sense of having a, a, a new topology, a new layout. All right, so this is the 16 qubit device. This is the, the picture of the mask. These are the, the, now you know these are the C naught directions. And uh, what you can also see is the last time the caliber, now, <laughs> I, I grabbed this in, uh, right in October, but this is calibrated in the morning and evening, I, I believe. Uh, maybe it's calibrated once a day. Anyway, you can see the latest calibration there. And then the results of that calibration is characterized by randomized benchmarking. So there's a gate, single qubit gate error across here. This is cut off. There, there are 16 qubits. Uh, readout error for each qubit. And then the multi-qubit gate error. So these, these numbers are consistent with what I said a few slides ago. If you want even more information about each of these backends, it's all available on GitHub. Uh, so you can go to this URL. And what you can find are, you know, you can find each device. You can see, uh, you know, who's contributed to this device, its history, uh, information about, say, in this case, how the readouts are multiplexed how the gates are implemented. And uh, over here is an example of how the, um, uh, how the crosstalk is characterized in the device. Okay, so uh, you know, please have a look at that if you're interested. All right, so those are the devices that are available on the quantum experience. And uh, now we'd like to think about programming them. So we've chosen uh, uh, an, an intermediate representation of our circuits that is, uh, you know, it's based on a quantum assembly language type description. Um, this will be, I think, familiar to many people, right? This, the, the model is that you have some register or registers of qubits. You have some set of classical registers. I'll say these, just conceptually, these registers are somehow close to the machine so that you can interact with them and feedback from them eventually. Right? That's what, these aren't meant to represent all the classical memory you're ever gonna use in your quantum program. They're meant to represent something close. Um, this is a picture, by the way, from the quantum experience from the composer where you can take gates and drag and drop them and construct a circuit uh, and then run it. So I'll just say, you know, here are the, these are these U1, U2, U3 gates, the single qubit gates. Uh, and this is the two qubit gate. And the rest of these are constructed from, from these or from doing nothing. Um, and there are some other instructions for, uh, 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 well, I'll come back to these later, right? There's a measurement and there's a way of controlling the timing. Okay. All right, so a little bit more detail. Since this is a tutorial, eventually I'm gonna get to the point where I'm showing you lots of code. So we'll kind of start going in that direction. Uh, this is an example of a program that's written in OpenChasm. So it has these features, right? It has quantum and classical registers, has some way of including definitions of gates. And then, um, right, it's just instruction after instruction together with what it acts on. And uh, what it, so there are a couple things that I can point out that are maybe interesting or different from other um, assembly languages. Um, one is that it has a, a way of hierarchically defining gates. So here's a Toffoli gate. It's defined in here, um, right, and it's put here, but that's constructed from you know, C naughts and T's as you'd expect, and those are constructed from U's, right? Um, and it has a mechanism for measurement and feedback. So measurement says where to put the result, 
and then based on the values of some register, you can apply operations afterwards. Okay. Now, at a high level, what this is meant to express is data dependency. You know, do this, then do this, then do this, and here, here are the inputs I need to do the next step. Um, there's no explicit timing here. The timing happens later at a lower stage. Um, philosophically, we want to separate quantum and classical processing as much as we can. This is meant to describe all the quantum computing. And the classical processing should be sort of encapsulated elsewhere. So right now, that's very simple. There's just this if. Um, but in the future, this is sort of the way we like to think. And we'd like the language to be agnostic about the hardware that's uh, on the back end. So just a, gen a general circuit description language. We are open to discussion, extension. This is open chasm. So you, you know, please let us know if there's something you don't like, you want to change, we can talk about it. The specifications are all online. All right, and maybe, um, yeah, I, I'll just say, I'll just highlight a few more things, right? This is how you make gates um, hierarchically from other gates that you've already defined. Uh, there are some syntactic things like, uh, you know, in some algorithms, it's quite natural to apply a Hadamard in parallel to many gates. So there's a way to do that. This applies it to every qubit in this register. And uh, there's this, so this barrier instruction says, you know, it's, it, it, it says don't cross this line, right? So if I have an optimizer that's walking through this circuit, uh, what it's going to do is it's, it's not going to combine these two x's into identity, right? It also affects timing. All right. So that's, that's chasm. And now, uh, now I'd like to start moving to QuizKit. I'll start first with the API itself. So I'm also going to focus mainly on the Python implementations of these components. Um, so I'll talk about the API, and then I'll talk about the um, SDK. All right. All right. So the idea, the idea is that um, so there's, there's a web API. It's a, it's a REST API. And you submit requests to it, like the back end I want to use, uh, the set of circuits I want to run. These right now are given as chasm circuits. And how many times to run each of them? It's pretty simple. So you submit this request. Right, this, it's processed, sent to the appropriate backend device. It gets processed further. Right, the experiment runs, and it comes back. There's queuing. There, there are other things here that I'm not going to talk about. And uh, after some time, the result comes back to you, and you can request it. Um, and you know, it includes the, the probability that you see each outcome string, uh, how long it took, other, other kinds of information. What's one of the important pieces, though, is that it gives you a, a, a um, you know, a collection of data that corresponds to the calibration, the most recent calibration before your experiment, which is always, it's good to have and uh, be able to um, combine with your uh, results. You can also make requests like, uh, you know, you can ask for a lot of information about each backend um, and uh, some information about the queue. This is all authenticated based on tokens. You go to the Quantum Experience website, you ask for a token, and then you use the token to access this. I'll give an example in just a little bit. Okay, so, so now, now some code. Um, right, so this is what it looks like if you just want to use the API. All right, so, so bare, bare minimum, I want to run something on the device. I don't want, I want, I want to talk right to the API. So in Python, you can import this uh, module that has the methods in it, construct an API object, you give it the token, you give it the configuration. So th this, this is the URL of the quantum experience. I'll show it to you, to you later. And this is some you know, long string of, uh, of characters. Once you've created this API, you can say, uh, what backends are, are there? And uh, it's going to send back a, a dictionary of backends. And you can look at the, the names of these. So um, you know, for each backend, let's look, look at its name, uh, as long as the backend is available. So it, backends may become unavailable if they're being calibrated or if they're taken down for some other reason. right? So you can check that. And this comes back and it tells us that two devices are available. This, this is 5 and 16. And there's an online simulator. Okay. And if we want details, we can go into this backend dictionary and look up, look up one. And we get all the information that's available for that backend. You know, um, just, I mean, for example, um, one of the more important pieces of information is how the qubits are connected. Okay, so this says pairs of qubits on which you can do a two qubit gate. All right. So now if you want to directly use the API to run a circuit, here's how you would do it. Um, you need to generate the chasm code, so here it is. This is code that 
makes a Bell state, right? I have two five qubit registers. I apply Hadamard to one of the qubits, a controlled knot between that qubit and another one, and then I measure them both. Okay. Um, specify the back end, how many times to run this experiment, and then it goes. And you get back a, a blob of data. And uh, I mean, this has a lot of information in it, but what's important to follow up now is the ID of this job. So you can grab this, put it in this call, and check whether or not it's done yet. Okay. So um, that's it. And then uh, when this is complete, you can, uh, you can go and retrieve this. And this, this will contain all the information. It'll contain what was run, uh, you know, when it was run, calibration data, everything. Um, and among all that data, one of the things you can ask for are these counts. So for each, each time through this circuit, we get a string, an output string, so the value of this register C. And uh, so this is returning the value of that register C and how many times we saw it out of the total number of shots we requested. Okay. All right. Now, so, so that's great. So you can run quantum circuits. You can run them through the API. Um, Maybe you don't want to work with the API at this level. You know, what if you want to do something that's more complicated? What if you want to optimize your circuits first and send them in? What if you, uh, you know, what if you want to use a higher level language to construct your circuits? I mean, it's not very easy to, to program to this API. So um, you know, we'd like to build on top of this. And so that's what we're doing here. Um, we'd like to, um, yeah, I'll, I'll just continue here. So let me go into some of the details. Um, all right, if you're interested in downloading this and trying any of this for yourself, uh, everything's available starting from here. So if you go here, you can follow from these links to, um, to any, any of the information you need. Uh, so just to point out, right, the, the code is uh, all open source. It's on GitHub. There are tutorials, documentation, and a link to the quantum experience directly from here, as well as how to get started. Now, I'll, I'll um, go through this in more detail in just a, a couple minutes. Uh, let me highlight a few, of the, uh, a few of the places you can go from this landing page. So there is documentation for this software. Um, it includes how to get started using it, as well as uh, uh, documentation of, this, of the code itself. So um, whatever level you're interested in looking at this code, you can do it through the documentation. And uh, you know, we've included some of our thinking in terms of how we have currently organized the code. The, um, the software is developed um, openly. It's all on GitHub. You can see our, our process. Um, you can see who's contributing to this and uh, you know, the things that are currently being worked on through pull requests. Um, we've been very fortunate that people, in, you know, people outside of IBM have been interested in contributing as well. Um, you know, the, the flow is essentially if you, if you want new features, you would open an issue and uh, we would discuss it. Uh, you can submit your code on your own fork through pull requests. This is a relatively standard way of of doing this. Um, you can see some of the, the files in the project for more details about how to contribute. Now, I, I focused, and I will continue to focus mainly on the Python, but in this project, uh, you can also see we have a Swift implementation of this code and a JavaScript implementation as well. So if you're interested in using other languages, you can. All right. All right. So. Um, the, the SDK is, the, the quiz kit is organized around a quantum program object. And this um, program object is a collection of quantum circuits that are all somehow related. So the way in which they're related is that the quantum program has a set of quantum and classical registers associated with it. You create those. And then you build circuits. And then you can run those on some back end, get the results, and bring them back. Okay. Um, in the process, you may rewrite them to run on some target backend if you have a limited connectivity. Right? To do that, um, there is a component that, uh, that rewrites the circuits. We've taken to calling this a, a transcompiler. And this is, the reason we do this is that we want to emphasize that our, our goal is not to go from a high level language all, all the way down to the lowest level code that can run on our system. We, we want to rewrite chasm to chasm. So we're sort of going horizontally. It's a li limited, uh, limited scope right now. We want to take our input circuits, and we want to make sure they run on the back end, and we want to make sure we eliminate as many gates as possible before we do that. Okay? Among the back ends, it includes uh, simulators as well. So this is, the simulators we have are also part of this project. All right. 
So, um, so how do you get started? Um, right, so you can, you can get two, two components from the repository. One is a set of tutorial Jupyter notebooks. So you can grab these directly from GitHub and download them. And then there are two ways that you can download the, the, um, this QuizKit software. Um, if you're interested in, um, in writing code or looking at the code, you can, uh, you can grab it from GitHub. Or you can simply run pip install and you'll get the latest stable version of it. Okay. So then if you want to get started, if you have, say, Anaconda installed and Jupyter installed, then um, you just install QuizKit and then start Jupyter. And if you want to use an online device, so if you want to use one of the quantum experience devices, there's one other step you have to do. Uh, you need to go to the quantum experience website under your account and get uh, uh, the API token there and then substitute it here. So you put in your token and put in the quantum experience URL. Okay. These are also in a file called qconfig in the, in the repository. You can fill them in there if you like to. All right. So now I'll walk through in the last, um, in the last part of the talk uh, a very simple example from start to finish um, and a couple ways of, of looking at what comes out of that example. All right. All right. So the first thing we need to do is make this quantum program object that will encapsulate everything we're doing in this experiment. All right. And this has methods that are generally, you know, they're, they're in the category of, you know, constructing these circuits and uh, manipulating them. It lets you import and export to this chasm text format. And uh, you can interface with backends, obviously. Anyway, so this is what it looks like to get started. So you make this program. You create a, a quantum register, or two or three. Um, this is the name that will appear in the chasm text. And this is the Python object to manipulate it, similarly with the classical registers. All right. So then this is what it looks like to create a, build a basic circuit for a Bell state. So make a program, create two, uh, a two-qubit register, and create a classical register for the results. Okay. So now we have all the objects we need. Now we can create a circuit, um, Bell, that we'll use to um, build, up, build up the circuit. Right? And on this object, we can apply gates uh, that, so these gates live here. They live in something that we call the extensions. And uh, you can, if something's not there, you can add new extensions. And they add new methods onto these circuit objects. Right. Um, I'll say more about it in a second. Right. But this Hadamard C0, as you'd expect, to make this state. Now, we'd also like to measure it. And, uh, we may want to measure it in several different ways. So let's begin by measuring it in the z-basis. So we'll make another circuit. It uses the same quantum registers. Um, and here we just measure all of Q into all of C. All right. All right. So um, let me just say a couple words about what's in this standard extension. The short answer is that everything that is in the, you know, if you click advanced on the quantum experience, all the gates that are there are in this extension. It's more or less what you would find in a quantum computing textbook. So you know the single qubit gates um, that you're familiar with, like uh, uh, Clifford plus T. Um, these are the U gates that are fundamental in our system right now. Um, two qubit gates. Uh, these are controlled versions of these single qubit gates. Toffoli, measure, reset. Um, reset is not supported on the hardware right now. Okay. And then there are a few other construction methods, and this will grow. Right now, it's relatively basic, but you can take a gate, apply it, and then invert it. And you can add classical controls to the gates. Uh, this will work in the simulator, but again, not on the, not on the experiment. Okay, so that gives you some idea of what's there. Sure. Uh, the th I believe the three qubit gate the three qubit gate should work through the uh, through the through QuizKit. So because it will be, I'm sorry. On the actual hardware. Y yeah, I believe it should. So it should be mapped down to two qubit gates and single qubit gates, and then those should be mapped onto the hardware. Yeah. All right. So we've constructed these circuits. How do you get some more information? There are some methods to access this, right? So you can say, what circuits do I have in this program? Uh, what registers do I have? What classical bits do I have? things you might need to know. And if you want, you can uh, ask for those circuits back in chasm form. And they come back in essentially the same way that you programmed them. You know, they, they're not uh, rewritten in any other basis. Okay. 
All right, so um, for this Bell example, you want to measure in more than the Z basis because you want to see that, you, that these qubits really are entangled. All right, so uh, to do that, we may want to measure, say, in the X basis. So we can create a new circuit to measure X, um, apply Hadamard to that register, and then measure it. And now we can take these, these pieces and compose them. So there's a plus operator that acts on circuits, so you can begin to stitch together more complicated circuits from these basic pieces. So now we, we build the two circuits we're actually interested in running. Make the bell state, measure it in the Z basis, make the bell state, measure it in the X basis. Okay. Now we want to run it. So we say, well, what backends are available? If, if, we, if you just type this uh, without setting up anything, what you would get back is the list of local backends. So on, on my machine, this is two, uh, two Python simulators and a C simulator. Okay. And uh, if you set the API and you make the same call, add it to the list, this list will be all of the online backends as well. So the simulator that runs remotely and the quantum experience devices. And of those, you can ask for the ones that are, that are the online backends. Okay. So now let's run the Bell State example. All right. so we set up the API again. Um, now this, in this step, what we're going to say is how are the qubits connected? So give me this map of couplings. So um, ask for the backend configuration, get the couplings. And now we say run the Z measurement circuit and the X measure measurement circuit in one job. You know, put them all together and send them to, through the API at once. And uh, here's, how the, here's how the qubits are connected on this QX4 device. Run this 1,000 times for each circuit. And you know, this will go through the API. It'll come back. This, this call is blocking, but there are other calls that will you know, submit everything, and you can come back later and, and uh, check. And uh, so after a while, you can ask this result object uh, for the results for each circuit. So in this case, measuring in the Z basis, we see some output like this from this five qubit device. And in the X basis, we see this. And I mean, what you can notice is that most of the outcomes are 0, 0, and 1, 1, as you'd expect for a Bell state. And these in the middle, these are errors. Okay. Similarly, in the X basis, you see something uh, just like that. Okay, so you see them correlated regardless of the basis you measure it. All right. All right. So, um, right, I mean, I alluded to this earlier, but this, if you, this instruction we wrote down is a C naught from 0 to 1, right? But the hardware, th this gate direction has to be from 1 to 0. So, so what happened, right? I mean, what happened is that when you called execute, it called some code that rewrote the circuit for you. So in the original chasm, there was a Hadamard and C naught from 0 to 1. And now the, the 1 and 0 labels just got flipped over here. And the relabeling happened on the measurement. Okay? So that's an example of, uh, of this uh, rewriting backend that we're working on. Again, the goals for this piece are to map the circuit onto one that can run on whatever backend we have in the future or now. And also to try to eliminate instructions so that we have uh, uh, more accurate results at the end. All right, so now uh, we, can run, we can run the experiment. We can look at these histograms. Oh, sorry, go ahead. You have a question? Um, so how much of cyber embedding would you do in general? Uh, how much, I'm sorry, can you say? Like this change that you, here you only change the direction, but it could be way more complicated. Yes, it usually it's more complicated, so, yeah. So does this add to the like, graph embedding, or is that <coughs> Yeah, I'll say a few more words about what it does, but yeah, it's right now, right now what's there is not close to optimal, but it works for any layout graph. Yeah, I'll say more about it in a second. All right, so we ran the experiment. Let's run a simulation. Um, now in the simulation, of course, we can ask for the state. We don't have to take shots. So um, if you'd like to do that, what you can do is you you can take the same circuit. You don't have to do any of that again, but you can just change the name of the back end. And whenever shots is set to 1 here, it um, will just compute the state vector or the unitary or you know, whatever the mathematical object is that you want from that uh, simulator. And then you ask for the results. And in this data, right, in this case, for this local simulator, it'll give you an array that corresponds to the quantum state. Right? This is 0, 0, and this is 1, 1. Um, you can do the same thing if you want to know uh, the unitary operation that you applied. All right, so in this case, uh, well, I mean, you can't, this isn't very easy to read, but it's there. Um, both of these Python simulators are, um, you know, they'll work for small circuits. Um, we have, um, 
you know, coming quite soon, uh, some C simulators. And uh, you know, at the moment, if you also need a very fast simulator, you can use uh, the online simulators as well. OK. So um, there are, um, there's a tools module in QuizKit that includes some plotting and includes some other useful functions. And uh, we'll be extending this. But let me just give an example from here. Right, you can uh, construct the density matrix corresponding to that quantum state from the previous slide, and then, um, and then plot it. There are a couple different ways you can view it, but this is a pretty standard way of looking at this. This is the this city plot. So you can see the, the main diagonal of the uh, density matrix, 0, 0, and 1, 1, and then the coherences. All right, All right so I'm going to take two slides just in case you're curious to, to know what's underneath, uh, what's behind this, what's the structure of the code. There are four representations inside QuizKit for quantum circuits, and we move back and forth between them as we need to. Um, and you know, in, in the future, the, well, let me, let me say, I'll say what these are first, and then I'll make my comment. Right, so the main you know, input representation is chasm text. Right? And at, when this is input, it's parsed. Right? You get some syntax tree corresponding to the grammar of chasm. Um, and then from here, we build a quantum circuit object. And this is just a, it's a hierarchical, hierarchical list of gate objects, right? This is, I mean, it's not too surprising. There are instructions, and there is a hierarchy of objects so that we can manipulate each of these instructions. Right? Um, when we want to rewrite the circuit, it's very natural to take the circuit and express it as a directed graph. So something like this. You have a bunch of input qubit nodes. You have nodes for each gate, and you have output nodes. And now you can walk through this. And I mean, it's a natural way to express the circuit when you need to rewrite it. Um, right now, these, we move back and forth between these as we, as we please. In the future, um, our focus is going to be to go to this representation, stay here, and uh, move over to this representation or others that we may need as we rewrite the circuit. All right. And just to comment on you know, what's underneath this, this uh, mapping process, right now, this is, this is what's here. It's a, fixed, a set of fixed passes. It's just four simple passes. And it, you know, it gives you a circuit that will run on the device. This can be improved. But uh, here, is, here is what is there. So we take the input chasm. We expand all these gate macros. Okay? So now, there, now it's written in terms of C naughts and these U sub, U sub J gates. This goes to uh, a swap insertion algorithm. It uses a randomized, greedy, layer by layer algorithm to fill in swap gates to apply the permutations between these layers. And then this introduces some redundancy, so we try to clean that up a little bit. We remove runs of CNOT gates. And then we optimize runs of single qubit gates that come from this. Right? And that's, that's all we do. Right? This, uh, this last method attempts to minimize, you know, for, each, for each run of single qubit gates, give you the minimum number of pulses to implement that gate. Okay? The way we're moving, um, hopefully you'll, you'll see this in the coming months, is a more modular framework something that we can uh, build on and extend and use for our research. All right, so in the last couple minutes, just want to talk about um, some more advanced things you could do with QuizKit. Um, all right, so if, if we wanted to characterize the state coming out of the experiment, one way to do this is with quantum state tomography. And in that case, we need to, make, we need to append many different measurements after building this Bell state. And of course, we're doing this in a higher level language like Python, so we can just write the functions we need to automate all of this and, and put them into uh, our set of tools. Right? So some of these tools have already been written for you. Um, you can find them, again, under here. There are tools for uh, uh, you know, quantum characterization and validation. And this example here is state tomography. Right? So you can use these methods, say what qubits you want to measure, build some state tomography circuits for your Bell circuit. And uh, right, it's going to create this array of create the Bell state and then do the, court, the measurement that you need. Underneath, right, this is all Python scripts. You can look at the source code to do this. All right, so if we run on the, so here we're running on the simulator, right? But we can take these tomography circuits and just run them and ask for the counts. And these are, you know, these are all the results we get from running those tomography circuits, each one 1,000 times or something like this, 1,024 times. And then there are methods here that will let you uh, put that data in a form that can be processed and then put it into a fitter, um, the, the details of which are in this code. You can look. Um, and 
obtain an estimate of the density matrix and then plot that. You could do this just as well, changing the back end to the experiment. All right. So there are many other examples that you can find online, not just, not just a Bell state. Um, and it's possible to run relatively complicated things through the, through the API. Um, to help you with this, there, uh, there are some tools that are part of the SDK. They include things for visualizing states and analyzing them. There are uh, um, helpers for optimization in quantum chemistry, QCVV. And uh, there's a collection of 24 Jupyter notebooks uh, uh, at, at this site, and they illustrate many different things. They illustrate how to use the SDK. They illustrate um, uh, ideas from verification and validation, um, near-term applications, and quantum games. All right, so I mean, there's some things you can do. I guess I'll highlight one of these, right? If you'd like, you can measure T1 for yourself. You don't have to believe what comes out of our calibration, right? You can measure T2. You can violate a bell inequality. All right, so just to conclude, um, right, this is our interface for experiments and simulations. Our goal is to enable our own research, enable your research, um, enable uh, educators and students. And we're looking at applications in this time period before, uh, before we reach fault tolerance. So, um, uh, you know, that's, that is, that is our, our goal right now. And we have a growing software stack. Um, we, we're going to keep building tutorials, keep adding examples, and uh, you know, plan to use this for quantum experience and access to other devices. It's a completely open source process, so uh, you can expect to see uh, new releases periodically. And we have ongoing projects right now to improve pieces of our infrastructure, improve our simulators, visualizers, um, change our back-end interfaces, things like this. So if you're interested uh, now or at any point in time, you can go here and, and have a look. If you'd like to contribute code, you can go here. And if you'd like to um, participate in discussions that help us define our next steps with this, we have a Slack channel that you can join. It's, um, if, you, if you'd like an invitation, you can go to the QuizKit landing page, and there's a link right at the top that you can click to join and, uh, and, and come talk with us on this community. Um, all right, with that, I'm done. thank you. Is the simulator purely unitary, or does it include uh, noise and decoherence? Yeah, so the current, yeah, so the question was, does the simulator uh, include noise and decoherence? So the current, the current simulators uh, that, that you can find online are ideal simulators. But very soon, we will be making available a simulator that uh, includes uh, noise, such, such as depolarizing noise and uh, T1, T2. Yeah. Uni unitary errors. Yeah. Other questions? Uh, yeah, there's a question here. What, what's the circuit size limitation? Yeah. Um, so I, I don't have off the top of my head the hard limitation. Um, I, I mean, I've run benchmarking experiments with many hundreds of single qubit gates through the API. Uh, and I do know that um, you know, near, near 42 qubit gates I was able to run uh, through, through the interface as well. Um, but I, I don't know the hard limits to that. Um, we could try to talk offline. Other questions? Can you say something about uh, gate parallelization and the barriers and the timing and stuff? Sure. So, so right now, I believe that when you, when you submit a circuit and it's scheduled, uh, the, go the goal is to maximize the parallelism. So uh, you know, two, two qubit gates that can run in parallel will, uh, they, you know, that may not be always what you desire. But I believe that's what happens. Other questions? Uh, well, let's thank Andrew again for a tutorial. <laughs> <laughs>